Martin North, John Adams, in the interest of people. Hello, John. Hello, sir. Back on your favourite subject. Indeed. Um, obviously, today is Wednesday. Uh, we, you had a very interesting live show with Tony LeCantro yesterday, <laughs> um, where, where you got Tony's views um, about what he sees with the property market, the stock market, the general economy. And we're back to this old age debate about inflation deflation now interestingly tony kept to his uh forecast of a 40 percent fall in um property prices now s- several months ago i said um even though that's theoretically possible uh it, with the harry dent deflationary depression I d- that's not going to happen in the short term because of all the stimulus that has been brought forward and as we go along this journey we have gone through presented new evidence particularly in the last show where we talked about in terms of stimulus being announced by the RBA in terms of state infrastructure spending and then when we look at the central banks around the world. Now, um, what I want to do in this show is talk about uh, what's happening for the rest of September as we go into early October with, with in terms of the budget. And we are seeing more calls for stimulus. We're seeing some, um, policy, some very interesting policy ideas being flagged in the press. And it's all pointing towards more stimulus. So we're going to get more stimulus going forward. Um, uh, I think some of the stimulus is going to be in a different composition. Um, um, and, and, and I think there's a, f- a range of factors which are going to bear on the government to really push the stimulus bucket. And, and, and obviously the question is, how do you finance this? Mm. And the financing aspect of is it, you know, the financing aspect of it is, is going to be inflationary. And this is obviously where the stagflation is going to come in because unemployment is expected to go to 10% by Christmas. And I think the RBA said that even by 2022, they're expecting unemployment to be around 7% as opposed to the 5%, which was pre-COVID. Yeah, and it's full of interesting moves here, right? Because a couple of the banks have come out and basically uh, revised their down movement into a much smaller number, right? And basically saying, well, unemployment won't be as high. And CBA came out today and said, oh, we've revised our home price uh, estimates now. And we think there's going to be only a very slight drop. And then it's going to take off again next year, right? So it's quite interesting how we are seeing some of the mainstream economists now becoming less negative. But Chris Richardson today in the press club uh, in, um, in Canberra basically was arguing that the most critical piece of stimulus that should be done is to keep the job seeker payment at the level it currently is because every dollar that actually goes into job seeker will flow into the real economy so he's still advocating more stimulus and of course Grattan also came out today and they've got a big argument too so pretty much everywhere you look everyone's saying let's just throw some more money at the problem right and then everything will be fine except the question is will it what I want to do Martin is to to obviously talk about quarter four Mm -hmm. so uh, now during last week, we saw the GDP number being released for the second quarter, yep. and that was negative seven. So that was, I think, a, a more dire number than what the consensus was. I think the consensus was minus six. Now, we're in quarter three at the moment, which is from July through to September. The treasurer said that he's expecting the GDP to be between zero, either flat, or it's going to be negative again. So we could have three quarters of negative growth. And then... Um, I was contacting a number of journalists last week to, to, to feel for what is quarter four looking like, and the expectation is about between one to two percent in terms of what that in terms of, in term, in terms of the growth number. Now, from the twenty eighth of September, uh, I mean obviously it's a very looming date for a lot of people across the country because this is when uh, job keeper and job seeker are supposed to reduce um, in terms of the first time, and then we're going to obviously see the federal budget being released on the 6th of October. So, so, we, so And there's going to be a whole host of new announcements um, that are going to be announced in that budget. Um, and obviously, one of the interesting things with, with a lot of these forecasts is a lot of these numbers and a lot of these projections were done before the second lockdown in Victoria. And, and it is interesting now that we're going through a second lockdown um, in Victoria, you still have some banks who are more bullish on the economy than than the Reserve Bank or Treasury. Yes. So there's a whole bunch of who knows, right? And I'm, it is intriguing that a lot of the economists are actually banking on Victoria opening sooner, probably, and that effectively the rest of the country coming back relatively soon now. So, John, you know, it's worth noting that the 
reason we're so concerned about the forward view is that job keeper and job seeker are going to be withdrawn, yeah. right? And the withdrawal is quite quick and quite deep, isn't it? Yes, yes. So, so we've got a couple of graphs that we're going to actually put up now. The first graph is something that you raised in a, in a DFA show, which is a graph from the uh, in terms of UBS, and 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 so, and so that graph basically shows that from quarter two to quarter three, we see a massive increase in in stimulus, both in terms of dollars, but also in terms of proportion of GDP, and then and then I think it's around twenty three percent in the third quarter, and then we see it fall to about seven and a half percent in quarter four, and. Of GDP. Of GDP, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and the reason why we see this massive fall in, in fiscal stimulus is because of this reduction, particularly around job keeper in terms of job seeker. So so what are those key key aspects that are going to start from the 28th of uh, September? Because to be honest, I knew some of it, but then when I saw some of the de- finer detail, hmm. um, there was one particular aspect about job keeper that I was... I didn't actually know because no. I because I'm not actually on the payment. So so when I looked at this, I'm thinking, wow, I mean, that, that, that's actually going to be bigger than what I thought it was going to be. It is quite tricky, isn't it? Because they've actually sort of bifurcated the the streams, and you know, people who perhaps thought they would have been on it aren't necessarily going to be on it now. Indeed, indeed. So so yeah. So I'm glad you mentioned that point. So so one aspect is is that the eligibility is going to be tightened up. Yep. So so there'll be some people who are on fifteen hundred a fortnight now under on JobKeeper who will just not be eligible at all. And they obviously if they have no financial buffer, that's going to be an issue. But those who still qualify for JobKeeper, um, the the aspect that I didn't fully understand until I looked at this the other day is um, your payment is based on how many hours you work pre-COVID. So basically, if you are on 20 hours or more a week, um, you are eligible for 1,200 a fortnight. So you go from 1,500 to 1,200. But if you're on less than 20 hours a week, you go from 1,500 to 750. Now, what, one one of the anecdotal criticisms that I was hearing about JobKeeper was that um, there were some workers, um, gig economy workers, casual workers, low income workers, who were getting more on JobKeeper um, compared to what they were earning in pre COVID. And there was this, you know, and I was hearing quite anecdotally some people were really cashing it in and either spending it frivolously on conspicuous consumption, <laughs> gambling, whatever the case may be. Uh, and then there were obviously some people who were saving, saving, saving some of that money. Mm. So some of those people will, will will actually go basically see the payment halve if they still qualify. Uh, and then obviously you know there'll be other people who are going from fifteen hundred in terms of twelve hundred. But 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 I dare say that a lot of these gig economy workers, um, particularly if you cannot still work, if you're going to see your income drop by half. With all the cost of living pressures that we see right across, I think that's going to be quite tough. Um, and obviously, we're, we're, we're only a couple of weeks away from this first stage bringing in. And then obviously, if you look at this uh, uh, picture that we have on the screen, we, we, we have the payment going from uh, $1,200 to $1,000 a fortnight um, uh, for this category of 20 hours or more from the 1st of January. And if you're less than 20 hours, you're going from 750 down to 650. So, um, so yeah, so that was, so this category of 20 hours or less, seeing your payment half, I, mean, I think for all those people in that category, that's going to be a very tough proposition. Yeah, and there are millions who are on JobKeeper, right? Across the economy. The other point to make is, John, that if you look carefully at some of the results from some of the bigger companies, like some of the big retail companies, they've actually done very well out of it because basically they've been able to declare superior profits and uh, bigger dividends because of job keeper flows coming into their businesses, right? So it's actually helped corporate end of town, certainly. The question is how much of that has actually flowed through to the pockets of real individual workers. And that's another issue which is still very vague, actually, at the moment. Yes. The other day I did see, I think the ABS released a word map. Um, where uh, look, uh, So, so that I think they surveyed a bunch of people and they said, what did you spend the stimulus on? And, and obviously bills and, and, and sort of, you know, those sort of costs were the main focus, mm. mortgages, etc. Yep. But there was um, a, a significant category that said, no, we, we have saved 
some or all yep. of this money. And the savings ratio went through the roof, right, this time around, yes. thanks to JobKeeper, JobSeeker, the superannuation um, yes. uh, withdrawals, and, of course, the fact that people have had less opportunities to spend because the retail sector has been somewhat locked down. Indeed, indeed. So, Manu, so we've just talked about JobKeeper. Yep. So, so, so when we get on to JobSeeker, so what, what's happened with those who are unemployed is they have still been eligible for New Start, which is the Centrelink payment, and then they've had a, uh, you know, the JobSeeker is a supplement on top of the New Start payment. Now, that payment has been five hundred fifty dollars a fortnight, um, and that's now being reduced from five fifty to two fifty, starting on the twenty eighth of September. Um, um, and, and then obviously there are some uh, additional requirements that will come up in terms of uh, mutual obligation requirements, etc. Mm. So, uh, and, I, and I think you said just early in this conversation that Chris Richardson said that that it's important for these some of these um, people, particularly if, if you've gone from job keeper and you're not eligible for JobKeeper, and you've gone and gone to JobSeeker, and then your supplement is being reduced quite significantly, I think some people are saying that that's going to squeeze a, a certain category of, of, of the population quite heavily. Well, the New Start discussion is, is pretty big, but basically it's not gone up for 25 years in real terms, right? So it's always been dropping, 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 right? And basically the supplement that was brought in uh, took it up to a level that was just probably about acceptable, right? And then it's being faded down again. And what Richardson was saying was, well, that new higher level is probably one that should be maintained because every dollar that people actually receive in this category is more likely to get spent, therefore it's going to do better work in the economy rather than, for example, giving tax cuts to the top end of town, right? Yes. So that's his, that's his point. And, and, you know, on an international basis, the new start, level is very very low so it should be kept higher is what he was arguing indeed so 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 yeah so i mean so so what we're looking at martin is in when we look at quarter four we're looking at a situation where uh, unemployment's going up uh, a bunch of people are going to be either re having reduced payments on job keeper or they or they're going to be shift to job seeker and, and the fall of income from JobKeeper to job, this reduced job seeker is going to be quite heavy. Oh. And, and, and that's obviously where the anticipation of, of this cash flow crunch in terms of the rise in unemployment and where we expect more pain, particularly in your household survey, is, is really going to sort of come to the fore. Noting that even before these changes, rental stress and mortgage stress, according to your index, is at an all-time high. Yeah, absolutely. It's worth saying, John, one other thing, and that is the government has extended the don't worry about trading insolvent for a bit longer to the end right. of the year, right? Because yes. that was something else that was, was going to drop off at the end of September. Yes. So that's been now extended to the end of the year, which gives people a little bit more wriggle room if they've got a business that's not actually trading well. But nevertheless, the data from the um, SME survey suggests that a lot of people are going to really struggle over this next three or four months. So, Martin, um, the, the importance of, of these changes with JobKeeper and JobSeeker is, um, you know, we're obviously going to see this crunch in terms of your household data. Yep. Um, um, and obviously, the purpose of these additional calls for stimulus is all about saving these people from default, because if they were to default, um, you know, that, you know, you would see this uh, debt bubble collapse um, and we'd go into the Harrodent deflationary depression. Now... There, there is a aspect uh, in terms of politics, in terms of um, the the lockdown strategy to deal with COVID nineteen, which I've been heavily critical of. It was government induced, um, and governments at state and federal level have caused uh, pain by these decisions. And, and obviously, there is a feeling that that they're responsible for this. So, 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 so you have some, so you have some issues around that. So, but, but. But really, when you start to look at, so, so there's two aspects of these calls for more stimulus. Part of it is these institutional voices. Part of it is um, the ordinary battler, as well as the, the mainstream media. So we're going to focus on these two groups. The first group is, so, so obviously, we have the Reserve Bank. We have like groups like Graddon and uh, banks, etc. The type of stimulus they're calling for is really about infrastructure spending, and obviously this is about keeping people, or, you know, creating new jobs. Noting that with your survey data, we're knowing that there's going to be a retreat in the private sector and their capacity to provide employment, particularly over the next, uh, 
you know, six to nine months. And one of the important points you made with Tony yesterday was that, you know, and this was a comment you made about real estate, but it's, I think, a comment important about the broader economy, which is um, these things take time. So even though we will see a cliff happen in, in a couple of weeks' time when job keep and job seeker change, the impact of that will actually compound as we go forward because as so while people may be having a bit of a buffer now because they may have saved some money that money when, as soon as that money runs out and that does take some time that you know obviously th- things things start to um, intensify mm. in terms of the financial position so the recovery that the RBA and others are banking on is we're going to get to 10% unemployment by December and then we're going to see unemployment go down because the economy is going to open up but we're also going to provide new employment opportunities where the private sector can't provide it. And, and, and obviously that's where this infrastructure spending um, comes into it. And obviously the question with that is, well, how do you finance that? But, but we obviously have the RBA, and we covered this in the last show, they're calling for $40 billion, uh, in terms of additional stimulus. Now, interestingly, um, back in June, the Grant Institute called for 70 to 90 billion dollars of additional stimulus to help this recovery uh heavily focused on infrastructure now they published an article in the conversation this week and let's put that on the screen and what they're saying in this new article is is that because of the stage four lockdown in victoria the bill is actually much larger so so it's not 90 billion anymore uh, now they didn't give a revised figure as to how much more but they're saying we need to spend more money um and and obviously um, now, the, one of the problems when you have uh, stimulus based on infrastructure, one is, um, is there enough re- uh, shovel-ready projects to be, to be able to spend, to, to be able to create those jobs? Um, because there is a timing aspect. But, and, and, and obviously, the, the problem I think we're going to see is we have, um, as you reduce income support, we're going to have this uh, immediate impact on household budgets. And, and if it takes too much time to create these jobs, then, then uh, a lot of households are going to um, suffer in, in terms of the in terms of the short term thing. So so you can spend all this money, um, and obviously that's going to be the focus because you know this decision, which is the biggest fall in GDP since the Great Depression, it's going to be it's going to have a two or three, four, five year impact, and obviously this increased call for for, for infrastructure spending is to smooth these issues over that two, three, four, five year period. Right, but the nature of the jobs that will be created around infrastructure will be quite specific, right? A lot of construction jobs, et cetera, et cetera, right? I suspect there'll be many people who won't necessarily fit into those new jobs that are being created. I noticed that there's quite a lot of senior managers and middle managers in a number of industries that are actually losing their jobs, right? Some consultants, right? I'm not sure how many consultants will be able to actually go and turn their hand to digging tunnels, for example, right? So, I mean, it's a really interesting problem in terms of how you find jobs and build jobs in different parts of the economy uh, for people with perhaps different skills. It's, it's, you know, so there's got to be something there as well, I suspect. Yes. Now, now, one of the interesting aspects of... So before we get on to this political call for stimulus, the interesting aspect in terms of how they're going to finance mm. the, in terms of the economic stimulus. So we saw a very interesting article in the AFR only a couple of days ago where, there, where the government will announce this in the budget. And we, you know, we, we don't know all the detail yet, which is to say that... Um, the banks will, sorry, the government will require the banks, uh, uh, and this will be APRA enforcing this on the banks to 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 hold about two hundred forty billion dollars of government bonds, so federal and state government bonds. And so, basically, what we understand it to be is the RBA has uh, increased its term uh, financing facility um, uh, up to two hundred billion dollars, where they'll provide three year loans at. 025 percent interest and so they'll say to the banks we'll give you uh, we'll just print all this money out of nothing we'll give you a, a cheap loan cheaper than the wholesale market but part of this condition to get this liquidity is you've got to um, basically pour this into um, uh, uh, particularly state government bonds mm. so, so so this is effectively a merry-go-round of QE but rather than the RBA buying now the RBA is still doing QE so they're going to directly buy state and federal government bonds but they're also going to, rather than exploding the balance sheet they're basically saying to the banks well you take some of it up as well and what they're actually doing john is 
replacing the committed liquidity facility, which is something which the RBA has with the banks, and allowing the banks to basically use these types of bonds in their capital structures. So it's got two intents. The first is to increase the capital structure of the banks, right? And secondly, to do the merry-go-round, you know, quantitative easing, or whatever you want. So it's got those two aims. Yes, yes. Now, um, we will talk about this after the budget's released, but I think this this is a very big deal because mm. I asked you and I asked a couple of other people who have deep experience in capital markets and I said, in public policy, I said, have you seen this before? And they said, no, look, look this sort of requirement to force banks to buy uh, government bonds, um, you know, th that, that seems quite new because, I mean, it seems to me that, um, you, you know, particularly... Um, uh, because banks have a responsibility to shareholders, the bank executives and the bank directors should be able to determine, well, um, we're going to uh, buy or we're going to hold assets uh, you know, that we think are safe. Because particularly when you look at some of these state government uh, bonds, the question is Queensland in particular. <laughs> yes. and, the, and, and we'll get into Queensland at some point in the future. The, um, there was a forecast. I mean, we've done a show already about Queensland earlier this year, and there's now a new forecast to say that the debt load for Queensland is going up to about $109 billion. There's going to be a real question about credit worthiness, credit quality, and whether these state governments are going to actually pay this money back. And if you're forcing banks to who are overly exposed to mortgages to start buying subprime, what, and, and here's the thing, the credit rating agencies call this high-quality debt, but if we know that some of these state governments are going to struggle to pay this debt back, I think it's sort of subprime quality. And if you're forcing commercial banks to, to buy this, that's going to have a huge question mark about the, the financial position in terms of the banks. But basically, um, that's how they want to finance this infrastructure, by printing money, lending it at a cheap rate vis-a-vis -vis the RBA, and for the banks to uh, uh, take this money, buy it into... Uh, buy these state government bonds, and then with this additional money that the state governments have, that's going to finance the infrastructure, that's going to create the jobs um, uh, that will hopefully prevent the debt bubble from imploding. Mm. It's a long bow when you actually explain it from one end to the other, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. So, so, so that covers the uh, how do you finance the, 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 this institutional call for stimulus, which is around infrastructure. Now, um, and obviously the other key aspect that we'll see in the budget is um, the coalition went to the last election with, I think, two or three stages of tax cuts. They've, uh, they've uh, delivered on the first round, and I think there have been some calls for Frodenberg to bring the second and third round. Um, so we're going to see some um, Commonwealth announcements on, on infrastructure, um, already banked into the cake, and we're going to see some tax cuts, and we're going to see some other things. And you know, particularly with this um, stage four lockdown in Victoria, I dare say that the budget deficit for 2021 is going to blow out well mm. beyond the 185 billion which was announced in my EFO back in June, July. Mm. Um, so n now, now comes into this um, the political call for stimulus. Now, there was a story yesterday on news.com.au that I thought was it just caught my attention. Um, uh, and, and I thought to myself, well, you know, given that I used to work in Parliament, I, I've sort of seen this before. So we have, a, we have, and let's put this on the screen. So we have uh, a, a, a woman who is on JobKeeper, is going to have a reduced payment from 1500 to 1200 who was on a good wicket in the hospitality sector, who can't work at the moment because of the restrictions. And basically she's saying that once she factors in rent, uh, paying for her car loan, insurance, a couple of other bills. She only has $40 a week for food, and how do you survive on that? And obviously, um, the way the story was framed by the press was a uh, hard-trodden Australian um, who is struggling to get by because of this lack of income support. Um, and, and in this article, Labor, in particular, Jim Chalmers, the shadow treasurer, basically, you know, was jumping on the government say, you know, um, madness to reduce income support because of these restrictions, the economy hasn't fully opened up. Um, and obviously, people are struggling. So even though we're going to have this mismatch between re this announced reducing of income support, as we've covered earlier in the show, and this increase of infrastructure, which is going to some, take some time to kick in. We have now this new political story um, and this new political narrative of the downtrodden Australia. And obviously, when, when we look at your data of, of mortgage stress and rental stress, 
the press will jump on those those people who make up your survey mm. and you're going to start to see more people who are struggling to to get by in the fourth quarter mm. and and I think this is why I'm expecting new announcements reversals on some of these policies and more income support to help some of these people get through to Christmas if you think about it we've got millions of people who effectively will be reacting to how they're treated through this process and at the next election they'll remember it so there is a pol real political agenda here isn't there yes yes so so i think there's we have political parties ready to take advantage of this from a from a Machiavellian perspective. We have the press who want to hype up some of these situations and obviously have a, a powerful narrative that their readers want to actually have reported. We have individual constituents who are going to be suffering and want stimulus. And obviously we, we've also seen, I think this was an article in the Australian, certain industry groups and interest groups like uh, uh, the property developers who are calling for, 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 for more stimulus. So you're seeing for political reasons, independent of the broader economic so, so you've got the RB doing dry economic analysis with Graddon mm. and they're saying well from a dry perspective we need more stimulus but then you have all these political vested interests mm. um, who are saying well you know what's in it for me you know I, I, look I, I, I want you I want you to provide me more income support or my industry is going down you need to do more for me and all of this political pressure I think it's going to bear heavily on uh, state governments, but particularly the co federal coalition. So, John, there's one question which I've got, which is, you know, we could take this as a purely economic discussion, right? But it's much more than that, isn't it? In a democracy, this actually questions some fundamental things, doesn't it? Yes. When we did the show with Campbell Newman, I had a quote from the 19th century where, so there were voices in the 18th and 19th century that were not for democracy, um, and, and these were not from third, you know, from from, from uh, totalitarian regimes. These were uh, from the from the from the uh, from the UK as well as from the United States. And, and so th there was a quote that we I said with Cameron Newman. I think it's still worth um, uh, repeating now because I think this is so central to where we're headed uh, in Australia. So this is Alexander Tyler, 1854, and the quote is quote A democracy is always temporary in nature. It is simply cannot exist as a permanent form of government a democracy will continue to exist up until the time that voters discover that they can vote themselves generous gifts from the public treasury from that moment on the majority always votes for the candidates who promise the most benefits from the public treasury with the result that every democracy will finally collapse due to loose fiscal policy which is always followed by a dictatorship now um I'm not sure about the dictatorship part but but the key point of this is is that as we see more calls for stimulus from people who are hurting um, from, in, in terms of people who can't get by uh, and as unemployment goes up, the public, um, and, and you can talk to any politician off the record, they will say the public does not care about government debt. There is no appetite to pay back to government debt. People don't care about surpluses. People just you know, want additional payments, particularly when they're hurting because they don't want to go through tough times. They don't want to face the consequences of their um, of the, of the ill sort of formed decisions. Mm. So um, you know when we've gone through austerity, politicians have looked voters in the eye and said, "Well, if you borrow too much money, that's on you, and that's not on me." Whereas, whereas now, people don't want to. Um, there's no concept of self financial responsibility. You know, you government help me out, um, and, and obviously the Australian people on mass, and this is maybe controversial to say, but I'm willing to say it, on mass, Australians have realized they can get something for nothing from government. Um, and there's enough of them to sway elections. Um, and, this, and this is why certain people in the 19th century said, don't have a democracy, because you're gonna go bankrupt. Um, and, and, and I should say, before 1832 in the UK, I mean, you did have a democracy, but not everyone got the vote. I mean, I mean, historically, it was either you were an aristocrat or you had to own property. So you actually had to have... So, so those who were poor, who had nothing to lose, couldn't vote because they would just vote themselves all these generous gifts. So, um, and, and, and there could be something to say about um, maybe not everyone. So, so when you look at democracy when everyone gets the vote versus democracy when only certain people get the vote... Um, there is a question as to, well, what type of economy, what type of outcome do you generate? But I think this quote is so important that 
the one of the reasons why I'm convinced we're going to have stagflation going forward is because people are going to basically say to Canberra, as well as state governments, if you don't give me money, I'm going to vote you out. And that's why they're going to say, well, we're just going to spend, we're going to print, and that's why we're going to have runaway inflation. Right. But I think there's an very important point, John, because you could blame the end user, as it were, but surely you should also blame the politicians and the regulators for their policy failure over 20 or 30 years that have created this opportunity. So it's not all down to the end user, surely. Oh, yes, yes. So if we're talking about mortgages, absolutely. We, we know over the last couple of years, we've been critical of the banks, of the RBA with interest rate policy of APRA in terms of um, the prudential standards, and, and of in terms of, even in terms of ASIC, in terms mm. of how the banks assessed uh, people to, to actually get the mortgages. So absolutely, uh, the the system um, did not do the right thing by. The, uh, by the average Australian. And obviously, mass propaganda convinced people um, that there was no risk. So one, one of the things that I say to people consistently on the phone about this show, th- th- this show is effectively two aspects. It's an anti-debt show, and it's a show where you and I believe that the level of systemic risk is far higher than what the average Australian believes. And, and so if the average Australian believed that signing a million-dollar mortgage was risky, most of them would not do it. But the reason why they do it is because they've been brainwashed to believe that, that it is a, a, a less risky proposition. And that's why they're willing to do those sort of, what in my view, are crazy things. So absolutely, the system has been um, uh, at fault. But also, I would dare say, now, um, I come from a, from a house, from an from upbringing where, we, where, I was, where I grew up not to be in heavily in debt and to mm. be out of debt. Yep. So, so at 38, I have no debt. Now, I, had the, I, I could have signed a million-dollar mortgage, but I didn't. So, so, so I, I took, even though the system was telling me to borrow, I rejected the system and I, and I basically have taken a, a, a prudent decision. Um, so, um, so, so, yeah, so, so, but for those who swallowed the propaganda and signed the million-dollar mortgage, those people, knowing that, they can go to the politician and say, bail me out, help me, otherwise I'm going to destroy your political career. I'm going to vote you out of parliament. That's the, that's the crux of why we're going to have a runaway inflation, stagflation situation because of this quote and what that actually means in a democracy when, when everyone gets the vote. And, 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 and that's why I expect. So, you know, for Harry to be correct, people have to default. Defaulting comes at a huge political cost for governments. Now, in the Great Depression, um, in previous depressions, governments during those periods were willing to look constituents in the eye and say, uh, you know, we're going to actually allow this bubble to collapse and we're Mm. going to restructure the economy. The modern politician in the modern age doesn't have that gumption. And I think these politicians are going to wilt quite heavily. And this is why I think we will see... More, more stimulus, more reversals, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if these announcements on job keep and job seeker get reversed in some fashion in the fourth quarter. Yeah, so we can pretty be sh- much be sure that there will be more money poured into it, and uh, there will be a cost of that, of course, in terms of servicing it, which probably be quite low because the interest rates are really low on on funding at the moment. But nevertheless, the risk is which is why you come back to your stagflation view, right? The risk is that this all flows back and it just lifts prices and it just effectively creates some, this really unstable environment. In, indeed, indeed. So, so, so yeah, so, so obviously we have, we know we have going to be rising unemployment. Everyone agrees universally. The question is how much will unemployment rise? Mm. Uh, we have a universal uh, consensus now, independent of perhaps me, that there needs to be more <laughs> stimulus. Um, so, because early on I said, look, no, let, let it collapse, let's, let's restructure the economy, no. let's have a depression. Um, and, and you said that on, on a show two years <laughs> yes, ago, controversially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, but, 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 but obviously, you know, with this inflation, sorry, with this stimulus, how do you finance it? Mm. It's through central bank money printing. Yep. And that historically, going back thousands of years, we know that that's going to cause runaway inflation, it's going to cause an issue with the currency. Um, and, uh, there's no evidence that I can see to date as to why history won't repeat itself. So it seems to me then, John, that um, you know there is going to be more money flowing through. There will be some degree of uh, inflation, 
depends on whether it goes into the financial system, whether it goes into the real economy, whether it goes into the stock markets. So that's why I'm a little bit less um, clear in my own mind than you are as to what's going to happen. But the trajectory is so much clearer because everybody just wants it. Yeah, yes. And, and, and because we can be clear that there is all these calls for stimulus. Um, I mean, and, and one of the important points on this, Martin, is I have had a conversation only in the last few days where a certain individual uh, who watches the show, who has a significant amount of money, has positioned his portfolio based on the Dent thesis. Um, and, and obviously the, the, the evidence. So, so this is not about um, who's smarter than who, mm. but it's just looking at the evidence. Yep. The evidence is we are seeing huge amounts of stimulus already. We're seeing more calls for stimulus from institutions or infrastructure. We're seeing political pressure being building from a whole range of vested interests to say, you know, you, you know, don't let me fall through the cracks. And, and putting all that together and noting obviously how this stimulus is being financed, it, it, it points to more evidence that we are going to, not only are we experiencing stagflation now, we're going to see stagflation going forward. And obviously, as I said in previous shows, in a situation where you have um, compressed incomes, either through unemployment or unemployment, as prices are rising, your mortgage and rental stress data is going to perhaps see higher highs um, moving forward into quarter four and in 2021. Yeah, well, we'll keep monitoring, John. We'll keep talking about this because it's probably one of the most critical issues that we ever touch. So thanks for your time today, and uh, we'll pick it up again soon. Thank you. Martin North, John Adams, and interested people. We'll see you next time.